changes everything. We sing with all we are, we claim your victory. Let it
this freedom, freedom to worship and praise you, God. Let's lift our voices, church. I raise a hallelujah, presence of the enemy.
every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and walk. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and 
lift you up. As we sing this, Lord, we're going to sing this bridge one more time. Every voice, every voice lifts you up in this house. On the faraway island of Salamisand, Yertle the turtle was king of the pond. The turtles had everything turtles might need, and they were all happy, quite happy indeed. They were, until Yertle, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. If I could sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king! I'd be ruler of all that I see. So Yertle the turtle king lifted his hand, And Yertle the Turtle King gave a command. He made each turtle stand on another one's back, and he piled them all up in a nine-turtle stack. All mine, Yertle cried. Oh, the things I now rule. I'm the king of a cow. I'm the king of a mule. I'm Yertle the Turtle. Oh, marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. And all through the morning, he sat up there high, until long about noon, Then he heard a faint sigh. What's that? snapped the king. And he looked down the stack. And he saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac. Just a part of his throne. And this plain little turtle looked up and he said, Beg your pardon, King Yertle. I have pains in my back and my shoulders and knees. How long must we stand here, your majesty, please? Silence, the king of the turtles barked back. I'm king, and you're only a turtle named Mac. But while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon of the evening was starting to rise. What's that? snorted Yertle. Say, what is that thing that dares to be higher than Yertle the king? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can and I will. I'll call some more turtles. I'll stack them to heaven. I need about 5,607. 
But as Yertel the Turtle King lifted his hand and started to order and give the command, that plain little turtle below in the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just Mac, decided he'd taken enough, and he had. And that plain little lad got a bit mad. And that plain little Mac to the plain little thing, he burped, and his burp shook the throne of the king. For Yertel, the king of all Salamasand, fell off his high throne and fell plunk in the pond. And today the great Yertel, that marvelous he, is king of the mud. That is all he can see. And the turtles, of course, all the turtles are free, as turtles and maybe all creatures should be. Welcome to week two of Parenting Through Proverbs. We will be in the book of Proverbs this morning. And yes, we are enjoying some uh, of Dr. Seuss's greatest hits over the course of this series. And I I forgot to do something last week, and so I want to do it this week. Um, I want to give away some of these Dr. Seuss books as we go along. So last week, if you weren't here, we talked about Oh, the places you'll go, all the places you'll go. So here's, you don't have to like play a game or anything. This, you don't have to like win it. Here's what I'm looking for. Do we have any, anybody who either graduated this year or is graduating this coming year or has a child or a grandchild that's graduating like this year? I don't care if it's kindergarten or high school or college. Do we have any, any graduates this year? Nobody's got parents, not kids. Okay, there you go. Uh, Caitlin, come here, grab this. Take it back to Mall Mall. Miss Mary Jane back there in the back. All right, my beautiful mother-in-law. And then finally, Yertle the Turtle and other stories. So this week, and this has actually got, you know, more than just the, just the one story in it. But uh, this week, we are going to be taking a look at that, at that first uh, age group of like birth to about five years old. Now, that's going to apply to everybody, and I'll get to that in just a second. But do we, do we have a parent who would like this book that's the parent of a child five and under going once? Or a grandparent, come on, come on, come on, come grab it. Parent or grandparent, I'll take either one. Grandparents play an, a, a huge role, an important role in the lives of their kids. Thank you very much, thank you. All right, so I do wanna say this. Yes, this series is, is geared primarily to parenting, but it applies to all of us because we are the children of God, right? And so what we're talking about over the next few weeks even though, you know, it's my goal and it's my hope that parents will, will glean some truths from it and we will apply it into our lives as parents, I want to do the same thing that I'm asking you guys to do. But I also hope that the things that we're talking about, all of us, will apply it to our lives, not necessarily just to hone our parenting skills, but to change who we are as we become more and more like Christ. Uh, God the Father is our Heavenly Father, but all of us as children, we are joint heirs with Christ. So there's some things that we want to make sure gets into into our children when they're, you know, five years old or or, or younger or older um, that probably still needs to get into some of us, even as adults. Because again, we're all uh, in in a different place on our faith journey. We have have different things, maybe some different gaps that we need to uh, to fill in. But if you'll remember last week, I love some some good comedy. If you'll remember last week, we watched watched a little video clip because what I said was, we're all kind of pretending at some point that we know what we're doing, right? I mean, I've got four kids. Jeremy is joining the club. He's got, you know, he's about to, his wife, his beautiful wife, Jamie is about to give birth uh, to their fourth. Um, and then some have more, some have a few less. But, you know, at, at four kids, you would think that me and Stephanie would know exactly what we're doing. But we don't, right? Having more and more kids doesn't necessarily mean that, you're, that you have more and more wisdom when it comes to parenting. All right, it might. Uh, but here's one of my favorite comedians, Jim Gaffigan, with just a, just a short, it's like 45 second clip talking about parents of multiple kids. Check this out. Oh. 
<laughs> and yes, 100%, that's pretty much what it feels like. How about six and seven? It, does that, uh, you know, okay. Um, it's just you're juggling more babies as you drown. Uh, but seriously, here's what I want to get across at the very beginning this morning. And that is this. Parenting is without a doubt hard work. Parenting is hard work, but it's also one of the most heroic things that you will do in your life. Parenting is hard work, but it's also one of the most heroic things that you will do in your life. And here's the reason why. In Genesis chapter 1, at the very beginning, the very first time that it says that God blesses Adam and Eve, mankind, and the very first time that he gives them a command, what he says to them is be fruitful and multiply. As a matter of fact, I think I have it for the screen, Genesis 128. Genesis 128 says, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Listen, if you are a parent or a grandparent or a great grandparent, you are living out God's plan for all of humanity. Now, let me also say this I know there are some people who have never had kids and will never have kids. I don't want you to feel like you are less than, but here's the reality of the situation that we are living in today and that mankind has been in since the fall of Adam and Eve. We live in a fallen and broken world. And in so many different ways, not necessarily because of our own personal sin, but because of sin in the world that has broken the world, there are lots of things in this world that are not going according to God's original purpose for our lives. Infertility should not be worn as a badge of shame by anybody, man or woman. But without a doubt, it's difficult. It's just as difficult, I think, to bear that as it is to bear children. But what it is, is a reminder. It's a reminder that we need God, that we need a Savior. We need God to fix this world, to mend it. That's why it says that God, our Father in heaven, loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came into this world to fix the world. Now, the first thing he did was pay the penalty for our sins by living and dying and raising again, and he defeated death, hell, and the grave. When he comes back the second time and he gathers us up to be with him, the Bible says that he will create a new heaven and a new earth, that we will have new bodies, we will be restored to that original purpose that God had in our lives, and sin will be wiped out. And then we'll be able to live the way that God originally intended for Adam and Eve to live. But know, know that as a parent, you're a hero because you are living out God's purpose in your life. You are living proof of God's plan for the world as you bear your children. And they are blessings to us. So what we're doing in this series is... um, is we're looking at, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at four stages of life because uh, what, what I want to do, what I, what I hope that you hear from me over the course of the weeks is as parents and grandparents and other adults who are a second voice in a child's life that, that, are, that are voicing the truths of God into a child's life, is that we want to leave a legacy, right? We want our kids as we leave them behind us to be a legacy in the next generation. And the crazy thing about a legacy, the hardest thing to really like come to to terms with, to come to grips with about leaving a legacy is that we never see the ultimate fulfillment of that legacy. The, The hope is that we will pass on, we will pass away, we'll die, but that our children and our grandchildren will continue to live on and to continue to grow that legacy in the future because we don't know as parents how our great, great, great grandkids are ultimately going to turn out. But the goal is that the legacy that we leave behind will not be a legacy of curse. Instead, it will be a legacy of blessing. That as we obey God, as we take a look at those Ten Commandments, you know, it, it says that the, that the sins of the fathers will be visited on even the third and fourth generation. We want to be breaking cyclical sins. We want to not be leaving behind the consequences of the stupid decisions that we've made. 
and instead leave behind the blessing of a life well lived according to the will of God and a legacy in our kids who will then pass it on to our grandkids and our great grandkids and our great great grandkids. That's the legacy that we want to leave behind. So just very quickly, we're looking at these four uh, seasons this morning we're going to be talking about basically, you know, birth to, to five years old, one to five. Uh, it's the disciplining years. Obviously, we watched Yertle the Turtle, you know, the story of Yertle the Turtle. And um, without a doubt, uh, Yertle the Turtle began to build his kingdom. Well, let me tell you, for birth to five-year-olds, they're already starting to build their kingdom, right? Now, now, guys, men, I am for members. You know we use this kind of kingdom language that we're prophet, priest, king, and warrior all the time, and we talk about how God gives us our own kingdom, our own garden, and we should be kings of that kingdom. We should, we should tend to our garden, and no young men get to come pick the fruit out of my garden until they're ready, until they're, you know, taking care of their own gardens, all right? That sort of thing. Um, when a two-year-old says, mine and no, that's kingdom language. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but what he's saying is, this is my kingdom. How dare you step foot? I'm on top, Yertle the turtle. We've all got a little Yertle in us. And our two-year-olds, our, our, our six-month-olds, are you kidding me? From birth, they've got a little Yertle in them. And so what we want to bring to that stage is, is some discipline, but it's also some self-awareness so that they understand there's more people in the world than just them. It's not all about them. But you also know if you're the parent or you've been the parent of a preschooler, it's pretty much all about them for the first few years, right? I mean, you've got to feed them, you've got to change them, you've got to change them again and change them again. And did we feed it this time? I don't remember. Did you feed, uh, is it my turn? You know, it's like over and over and over again. But it, we need some discipline there. So then uh, next week we'll talk about the training years and then the third week, the coaching years from 12 to 18. Because here's the goal. When we get to that 18 plus, I don't have kids there yet, but I've got one that's getting close. When we get to that 18 plus, that's where we are hoping that we've locked in that legacy so that we get to those friendship years and actually have a child that we want to be friends with. I mean, uh, y'all laugh, and I know it's kind of funny, but that's really the goal of parenting, right? Right? It's, it's to raise a child that, that sure is full of the fear and admonition of God that has trusted Jesus as their Savior. But I think even more simply, it's just raising a kid that's not a jerk, right? <laughs> raising a kid that's, that's, that's not just a piece of trash that you don't want at your Thanksgiving table. And I'm real clear, because there's some people in the world that you feel that way about them. Now listen, God does not create trash, and I'm sorry if I offended anybody. But y'all know sometimes you think about certain family members and like you just don't want them around. Let's not, let's not let that be our kids. That our kids, we want to be friends with them, that that's part of the legacy that we're leaving behind. Because what we do today influences who they will be in the future. We're going we're gonna to get to that uh, in just a few minutes. But you know, part of the reason that, that this is so important, that this, this stage, the disciplining years, the first five years, Part of the reason that this is so important is because if you don't win as a parent in this stage, listen closely, if you don't win as a parent in this stage, you run a high likelihood, you run a risk of parenting your 13-year-old and your 23-year-old and your 33-year-old like you should have been parenting your three-year-old, where you were constantly correcting and disciplining, or at least trying to, and wondering what went wrong. Well, a lot of times what went wrong at 33 actually started when they were two or three. So let's win at this stage by bringing some discipline into the lives of our kids so that they understand, yes, God has given them their little kingdom. God has given them dominion and domain and authority. You know, if, if we go back to Genesis 128, actually go back to Genesis 128 real quick. It says that, that God blessed them and he gave them the command, be fruitful and multiply. And then it says, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Part of God's plan for our lives is for us to have dominion and authority over what God has given us dominion and authority over. The problem comes when we're an adult, we're 18 or we're 8 or we're 58, 
And we try to take control over something that we have no business taking control over. We want to have authority and dominion over something that God has not given to us. And so we start at the very beginning at, you know, under five years old. Our kids are sponges under five years old. How many of you, raise your hand, learned to speak the English language before you were five? Go put your hands up. Put your hands up. How many of you learned to speak English before you were five? You learned to communicate. You're all geniuses. Put your hands back down. You're geniuses. Because, you know, experts tell us that English is like one of the hardest languages to learn in the world, and congratulations, you know the language. (laughs) I doubt any of you, and I know there are some kids who have developmental delays, you know, no, no shame there either, but I know most of you, if not all of you, you learn to speak the English language before you're five years old. That's just kind of the natural flow of life. It was so hard, but our kids get it so easily because they are sponges. There's so many other things in life that are hard to understand, that are, that are hard to, to manage and to manipulate, that our kids need to begin learning under the age of five years old because they're little sponges. We're, 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 uh, we're, we are programming into them who they are going to be in the future. So Proverbs 19, 18 says this, it'll be up on the screen, and this is the, the key verse of this morning. So if you're writing any verses down, this is the one. It says, discipline your children while there is hope, otherwise you will ruin their lives. I just let that one sink in for a second. Discipline your children while there is hope. There's hope under the age of five. It begins to wane a little bit as they get older. But remember what I said, you don't want to parent your 33-year-old like you should have been parenting your three-year-old. Discipline your children while there is hope, otherwise you will ruin your lives. So I'm going to give you several things if you want to write it down this morning, but if I had one main point, one thing that just is kind of the overarching theme, it is this. Who my kids are then is connected to who I am now. Who my kids are then is, is connected to who I am now. So let me kind of flesh that out for you. Uh, I've taken a lot of parents through an exercise where you, know, you just begin to, to imagine your child growing up. You know, the, you, you remember the, you know, the first day that you brought them home, the little outfit, you know, that they took that first picture in on their you know, first day out of the hospital, and you put them in the, 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 the little carrier before you carried them out, and you took a picture of that, and then dad picked it up, and you took a picture of that, and then mom picked it up, and you took a picture of that, then you, the nurse came in, and she picked it up, and you took a picture of that, and then you, and you carry it down to the car, and you put it in the car, and you take a picture and a video while dad's trying to struggle to get it in, and then he took a picture when they're all strapped in. You know what I mean, right? But it doesn't end on that first day when you take a million pictures of the first kid. And trust me, you don't take as many when you get to kid four (laughs) or five or six or seven. Uh, At least you don't print them out, maybe. But um, eventually that child grows up. And so we begin to imagine the future. You know, if you've got toddlers, you begin to imagine that first day of school. If you've got kids in school, you begin to imagine maybe high school. You, You begin to imagine graduation. And where I want parents to sort of end up in their minds as they're imagining their kids grow up is that first Friday night as a college freshman sitting in their dorm, they've moved away from home, you've helped them move into their dorm earlier in the week, they've gone through you know, orientation in all these classes, they've begun to make friends, and there's that first Friday night sitting in their dorm on the edge of their extra long twin size bed because that seems like that's what every college has. And they're faced with a choice. What do I do tonight? Who do I hang out with? Where do I go? What decision am I going to make on this Friday night, probably the first time they've had complete freedom? Who do you want your kids to be then? Who do you want your kids to be then on that night? Who do you want them to be when they're walking down the aisle with their significant other? Who do you want them to be when they have their first children and they begin to give birth? Who do you want them to be? Who you want them to be then is directly connected to who you are now and the kinds of things that you do now, that you believe, the the habits that you build in your own lives. It's directly connected. 
So yes, part of this is we got to work a little bit on us as we work a little bit on them. Does that make sense? All right, so Proverbs 16, 18 says this, uh, first pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. That's from the message translation. I really like that translation. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the, the fall. There's a little yurtle in all of us, right? Yurtle the turtle came crashing down and he was now just the king of the mud. And 375 BC, so somebody do the math, it's smarter than me really quick. That was a long, long time ago. In 375 BC, Socrates said this, children today are tyrants. They contradict their parents, gobble their food, and tyrannize their teachers. <laughs> and nothing has changed, right? Nothing has changed. Children are still, can still be tyrants. So we need to begin working to discipline them. If we allow the human heart to become all about itself, which is what Yertle the turtle did, if we allow the human heart to become all about itself, then that is a heart full of selfish pride, vain conceit, self-ambition, and it's the kind of heart that, quite frankly, we don't want to be around in the future. So we need to begin teaching our kids that you don't get everything that you want. And it's important to teach our kids when they're young, again, because they're sponges. So I'm going to give you three foundational truths. These are things that you need to know, that your kids need to know. Very quickly, three foundational truths to teach your kids in their preschool years. And the first one is, God made me. God made me. Proverbs 16, 4 says, God made everything with a place and a purpose. Our children need to grow up understanding that they were created in the image of God for the purpose of God. So often, unfortunately, kids here, even under the age of five, all, it seems like all they hear from their parents is, no, don't do that, you're bad, stop being bad. And yes, we have to discipline our kids. But in those disciplining years, when yes, sometimes you have to have difficult conversations, you have to do things that you, you, you wish and maybe even said you would never do to, to discipline your kids, we still need to have the encouragement in there, the understanding that you were created in the image of God, that God made you a beautiful young girl, a, a strong young man, handsome and, and smart uh, for our boys and our girls, that, we've, that we build into them that God made them. They're not an accident. And if you've been treating your kids like accidents or your, your grandkids like accidents, stop it. They're not accidents. They're blessings. Be the hero, not the zero in your child's life. Let them understand that God made them and that God has a future for them. He didn't just make them so that they would, you know, make their bed and clean up their room and, and eat all of their peas or whatever it is, you know, that you make them eat, broccoli and Brussels sprouts, right? He created them with a purpose in life. And part of our job as a parent is to help them discover what that purpose is. But the first foundational truth is God made them. They're not, and, and the world will tell them that they are a cosmic accident. And we've got to make sure that we run from that. So number one, God made me. Number two, the second foundational truth they need to know and that we need to understand, God loves me. God loves me. On the count of three, everybody just say that with me. Are you ready? One, two, three. God loves me. We don't say that often enough to ourselves. I don't think we hear that often enough, and I don't think our children hear that, to say to them, God loves you. Um, I think it was George when we were in South Florida. We used these same three truths. By the way, these three truths are on the hallway back there outside of the nursery. Uh, they were in our preschool space in South Florida at the church that we were at. And, um, and our, one of our favorite preschool teachers would, and we would say it to George too, we would say, you know, who loves you? Well, daddy loves you. Who else loves you? God loves you. Um, and we had this one like preschool worker who, who uh, started telling George that she loved her, loved him as well. And one night, I, what was her name? I, I just blanked. Miss um, Patty, Miss Patty. Who loves you? Miss Patty loves you. Who else loves you? God loves you, right? So we get George home one night and we ask him, who loves you? <laughs> Miss Patty loves me. Like, no, I love you. All right, who cares about Miss Patty, right? But I, I love the fact that we have 
nursery volunteers and preschool volunteers in our children's ministry who will build into our kids and who will, who will be that other voice in their lives telling them that, that God loves them. We as parents need to be reminding our kids over and over and over again that God loves them. Um, there is a, there's this idea, uh, there's a word called attunement, and it's this, it's this idea that our children, even as babies, will sort of tune into, they will recognize what's going on in the, in the world around them, and they'll kind of be in sync with you as you're holding them. So like if you've ever smiled at a baby, at a newborn baby, once their eyes, you know, learn to focus and all that, if you smile at a baby, a lot of times they'll smile back at you, right? And then if you start frowning at a baby and maybe you make a mean scowl, they'll st- I don't try it because they'll start screaming and crying and then you got to take them back to mama and say, you fix it, right? Th- that's attunement. As they turn to the face of the father or the mother, their attitude will begin to change. Well, listen, we need to turn our face to God as parents, as adults, and understand that God loves us. He is smiling down on us. He wants what's best for us. We need to tune our hearts into the face of God so that it changes how we feel about ourselves. Listen, that was my prayer this morning in the middle of worship. When it seemed to me like there was just a spirit of darkness around us, and we needed to, to tune ourselves into the heart of God. And I just, obviously you saw, turned on the lights, right? Let's just shed some light this morning. It was a little different for us in worship. But we needed to, I felt like I needed, if, if y'all didn't need it, I did, all right? I needed to see the face of God to experience the, the physical light and the spiritual light in this, in this place. And our children need the same thing. When they see us, yes, there are gonna be times when, we're, when we get angry, Right? There are going to be times when we get mad, but they need to understand that we love them. And so, for instance, if you're going to discipline your kids and, and you're, you, you've been doing that out of, a, uh, out of anger, part of what we need to do is just send them to their rooms first, give ourselves time to calm down, and then go in and lovingly discipline them. But our kids need to see our face. They need to see in our faces joy and rejoicing. In fact, um, Numbers 6... Um, 24 to 26, we sing this song all the time. The blessing, right? Here's here's where it comes from, part of it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Our kids need to see the face of God in our faces. We need to make ourselves more and more like him and be a blessing more and more in the lives of our kids so that they will understand Just how special it is that God thinks about them, that he made them in his image, and he loves them more than anything. And then finally, number three, the third foundational truth is Jesus wants to be my forever friend. Jesus wants to be my forever friend. So when a child gets a hold of the gospel, it's a beautiful thing. When when a child understands, when they trust Jesus as their Savior, we should teach them very simply. John 3, 16, if your kids can't say that verse, teach them that verse. That's the first verse that we teach them in Sparks in Awana. When they they go through Awana, we teach John 3, 16 over and over and over again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. All of you as adults, you can use that verse to share the gospel with somebody in the world around you. Four simple steps. Uh, for God so loved the world, God loved, that he gave his one and only son, God gave. That's what God did. God loved the world so much that he gave. God loved and God gave. That's what God did. Here's what we do. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved and he gave, so we believe, and when we believe, we receive. We receive the gift of eternity, the gift of, of everlasting life, the gift of salvation, of forgiveness from our sins from God. John three sixteen, You can share the gospel and plant that in your child's life. Um, and I know some of you are probably thinking, well, I mean, we're talking from birth to five. Isn't that a little young for a child to, to get saved? I will say that for the average child, it's around seven and a half years old, their, their mind goes from very, very concrete, that everything is just practical and concrete, 
and most kids developmentally around the age of seven to eight years old, seven and a half years old, their brain begins to open up and to understand figurative language and to really understand who God is and, 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 and ask questions about the Holy Spirit and sin and salvation. It's kind of the average age. But kids much younger than that can and do trust Jesus as their Savior. My, my, my favorite story of my four kids is that one night again after church, um, we were, we were in an auditorium on a Wednesday night. Church was over with. We're just hanging out with parents. And there's some middle schoolers and high schoolers who were getting baptized in the baptistry. And we're just there as friends, like watching them and you know, cheering them on, that kind of thing. And I've got Campbell in my arms. She was four years old. And in my arms, um, Campbell just sort of leans over to me. I'm not asking her questions. We're not having Bible time. We're just standing there chit-chatting and, and watching this, ba- this baptism. And at four years old, Campbell leans over and says, Daddy, I know why they're doing what they're doing. Oh, really, why is that? Because they have Jesus in their heart. Just like I do. Still, as a, as a dad, it, it brings tear to my eyes. Because 3 John 1, 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And as a parent, there's no greater joy, as a Christian parent, there's no greater joy than to see our children come to faith in Christ. And I'm convinced, I don't know when it happened for, for Campbell. Now, she didn't get baptized that night. You know, it was a little bit later. I think, I don't remember if she was five or six. It wasn't long after that. We had a conversation with her, and, and she was baptized. But I'm convinced at four years old, she already had Jesus in her heart because she had been taught not just by us, but by our loving church and our, our nursery and our preschool volunteers. She had all those voices in her life telling her that God made her and that God loves her and Jesus wants to be her friend forever or her forever friend. And she had learned, I've got Jesus in my heart because I believe in him and I trust in him. Let's want that for our kids, that that's the, the kind of story that they tell. So to do that, there are two essential practices that we need to do. The first three, that was, that was what we want them to learn. God made me, God loves me, Jesus wants to be my friend forever. Here's what we need to do as parents. Number one is love irrationally. Love our kids irrationally. Proverbs 23, 25 says, may your father and mother rejoice. May she who gave you birth be joyful. Now listen, th- this verse is really kind of targeted to, to children sort of like, Act right so that your kids, so that your parents will rejoice. But I want you to look at the verse from a different standpoint. As a parent, may you give yourself permission to rejoice over your kids. That you celebrate things in their lives, that you love them even irrationally. That even when they mess up completely, that you walk in and you give them mercy and grace. I'm not saying don't discipline them, because they still need to be disciplined. But that in so many different ways, we want to love them like our Father loves us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were not, we did not have to become perfect for God to love us, and our kids don't have to be perfect for us to love them. We've got to tell our kids over and over and over again, it's okay, I understand that you, that you failed. I understand that, that, that something bad happened. We don't, we don't discipline our kids when they made a mistake. We don't, we don't spank our kids when they accidentally drop something. Now, some of us as parents, we've done, I've probably done that out of anger, honestly. But I want you to hear me. Like, however you discipline your kids, I know some spank, some don't. You know, you have time out chair and, and time in the corner and time in your room and, you know, hard time, whatever. Nobody laughed. That was a joke. It'll hit you in a minute. But we don't spank our kids, we don't discipline our kids, we don't send them to time out when they accidentally do something, right? We love them irrationally. Yes, that was a hundred dollar whatever that you just broke, and I'm really mad about it. But you're still my son, you're still my daughter. I still love you, it's okay, it's just stuff. It's far more important that you're okay, that you're safe, that we have this relationship. And we discipline them when they need to be disciplined. Children at the age of five, you remember me asking you about the English language? Did you all learn it? 
before you're five years old? Yes, because you're geniuses and all your kids are too. Kids are going to learn love, the language of love, what love looks like, how love acts, what love says, the same way that they learn the English language. Before the age of five, if they don't see love in your home, love directed toward them, love directed towards your spouse, love directed towards the church, love directed towards God, if they don't see and experience that love before the age of five, it becomes more and more and more difficult to change their understanding of what love truly is. Love comes from God. It does not come from anything else. I won't even go into all of that. But our kids need to experience love and see that in our lives. And then number two, we should discipline diligently. Love irrationally, but discipline diligently. Let me give you a few Proverbs here. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Now, I realize that that verse has been used by some parents to, to abuse their children. Discipline is not about abuse. But there are times when we need to use a rod. Proverbs 20, 22, 15 says, A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it far away. Proverbs 3, 11, and 12 says, My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline, and don't be upset when he corrects you, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. God disciplines us because he loves us, he delights in us, he wants what's best for us. We discipline our children because we love them, we delight in them, we want what's best for them. Children need, children need, parents listen to me, children need for their parents to discipline them. At home, at Walmart, at church, at school, on their way to school, on their way home from school, right? You know, if, if they get in trouble at school, they ought to get in trouble at home. Not, well, your teacher just doesn't know any better, right? Although maybe there are some teachers where you say that about. Another, another conversation. It's important that we understand the distinction between discipline and punishment. God does not punish his children. There will come a time when God will punish all those who are not a part of his family and a part of his kingdom. But God does not punish his children. He disciplines them. And in our homes, we have to be careful that we make the distinction between punishment and discipline. And so it looks kind of like this. Let me, let me, I've got a little chart I want to put up on the screen. The purpose of punishment is to give a penalty for something that somebody has done wrong. The purpose of discipline is not a penalty, it's maturity. It's to grow them into who you want them to become. The, the focus of punishment is what you did in the past. I can't believe you did that. And listen, if you're, if you're punishing because of the past, that past, it keeps living on. All right? There's a lot of shame that comes because of our past. And if we're constantly punishing somebody over and over and over again for something that we're bringing up that they did in the past, grandparents, sometimes we do that with our adult kids. Sometimes it happens. That's punishment. Discipline is focused on the future. Again, it's who they're becoming, not what they did wrong. Yes, you have to discipline it. There was something that was done wrong, but you're, you're disciplining based on who you want them to become in the future. And then the attitude a lot of times with punishment is simply anger, but we discipline out of love. And then finally, the result of punishment is usually fear and guilt. You are guilty and you should be afraid because I'm bigger than you are and this is going to hurt really bad. That's the result of punishment, but the result of discipline ultimately is security. It's security. It's understanding that I've got these four walls, I've got this fence, I've got this boundary that I'm expected to live inside of. And as long as I'm within this boundary, I know that my life is going to go well. I know that my parents love me because they've been disciplining me like the father disciplines them. And there's love as a part of this relationship. And there are clear boundaries set up because they want what's best for me. And there is security that comes from some of those boundaries. So very quickly, and I want to close with this, very quickly, five C's of discipline. They'll all be on the screen together. We should be clear. We should be consistent. We should be calm. We should be careful. And we should be compassionate with our kids. Let's be clear in our discipline. 
A child will not understand. They will not change. They will not become more mature. They will not correct their, their, their poor behavior if they don't understand what they're being disciplined about. We have to be clear in the instructions that we give our kids and clear in the discipline as a result of the instructions. We also need to be consistent in that, right? We can't just keep changing the rules on them, right? Keep, keep moving the, the, the goal post, you know, moving the, the end of what they're supposed to do. We need to be consistent about both the rules that we place in our, in our homes. And by the way, your house is your house and my house is my house. Don't you dare tell me how to raise my kids, even though I'm telling you how to raise yours. <laughs> but seriously, every family is a little bit different. There are certain guidelines that God gives us as Christian families that, that we should abide by. But like in my house, we eat food in the kitchen, except for when our kids sneak it up to their rooms, right? But that, that's the rule in our house. And so if we're going to discipline our kids, and sometimes their friends come over, and we have to let the friends know what the rules are of our house. Because that wasn't necessarily my rule growing up in my parents' house. A lot of times I took food to my room. I don't need to do that, right? And it may be something different, you know, in your house. You make your rules, but be consistent in both the application of the rules and the application of discipline. Be calm. I mentioned this earlier. When you, kids are going to make you mad. There are some times when you just want to literally slap that smile off their face. Be calm. Send them to their room. You cool off and then go have a conversation with them. That's a great strategy for a lot of parents. Be careful. Be careful. Kids are different. Um, research does show that spanking is effective between the ages of two and five. It does work. I'm not telling you you have to do that. But when you do it, be careful. Be careful that you don't take that too far. Also be careful because your kids are all a little bit different. Caitlin, I love Caitlin. Caitlin, I love you. You know that you are the apple of my eye and sometimes a pain in my neck. But no, I love Caitlin. When she was younger, when she was three, four, five years old in this age group, you could beat her to death and she would just stand there and like, and now what? <laughs> right? So with her, I mean, I'm not kidding. I had to be careful as a father because I just wanted to hit her harder. But when does it become abuse? Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm making a joke about it, but I'm still very serious. All of our kids are a little bit different. Here's what I say about, just personally about discipline. It should hurt, but every kid hurts a little bit differently, right? And I don't mean it should be, maybe I should change that word. It should be painful, but not harmful, right? They should feel some pain. For some kids, depending on the stage of their lives, it's taking away the cell phone. For some kids, it's a, it's a little pop on the butt, and it can be a little pop on the, on the behind. And that's all that they need. There was a stage in my kid's life, all they needed was for me to do was, was lean over and just whisper in their ears, do we need to go to the bathroom? No, daddy. And they straightened up because that's all I needed to say, right? Be careful. All of your kids are different. Be careful how far you take it. And then finally, be compassionate. Be compassionate. Have a loving conversation. If you just send your kid to their room, you just ground your kid, you just take the phone away, you just spank them. If you just do that and nothing comes on the back end of that, there's not a conversation explaining why this is important to you, why they broke the rule, how they broke the rule, why you're disciplining them the way that you are, then there's no compassion in that. Our kids need compassion from us because, because who my kids are then is directly connected to who I am now. Now, I love Caitlin. When Caitlin was uh, two, three, four, five years old, she used to wear a lot of little pigtails and bows. And it was daddy's job most mornings. I mean, mama did it too, but it was daddy's job. Like I was trying to, you know, help mama out, right? So one of daddy's jobs most morning was brushing that hair and getting it in. And I got these little short stubby fingers that are kind of fat and it's hard getting those little Ponytail holders just right, you know. I'd have like bloody fingers by the time I was finished. But it was my job to brush her hair and, and get the little pigtails in and put the little bows that mama had already picked out because they matched every outfit, right? And she let me do that. There was a point where she even let me cut her hair. She's grown out of that now. She fixes her own hair. She goes, you know, and has it, has it cut, which is probably what she needs to do. The day's gonna come when she's gonna meet a boy and he's gonna run his fingers through her hair, 
and I hate that young man right now. <laughs> but I'm praying for him. And then there's going to come a day where she's going to put a veil on her hair. And then there's going to be a honeymoon, and I'm really going to hate that young man. <laughs> but I'll love him, and I'll pray for him. And then there's probably going to come a day when she has a child of her own, and that child will reach up and pull on her hair, and she'll be trying to figure out, how do I glue these little bows on this bald head trying to get them to stick, right? That's what you do with your baby girls that don't have hair. And then one day her hair is going to turn gray. And she's going to have grandkids, or maybe even great-grandkids, while she's still alive. And in that moment, when her hair is gray, and she's about to breathe her last breath, who she is then is somehow connected to who I am and who her mother is now. It starts at birth, and hopefully we're leaving a legacy behind us. So parents, grandparents, discipline your preschoolers. Discipline yourselves in every area of your life so that who they become is more and more like Christ because we are becoming more and more like Christ. Let me pray for you this morning. Dear Heavenly Father God, I love you. Thank you for loving us. God, there are no perfect parents. But where we fail, your love fills in the gap. There are no perfect parents. And where we fail, your discipline, your grace, your mercy, your strength, your love fills in the gap where we fail. And so, God, I pray a blessing over my church family. For the husbands and wives, the moms and dads, the grandparents, the single moms, the single dads, the aunts and uncles, the friends of the family in the room. God, I pray that you would continue to bless us as we go through this heroic act of not wanting to screw our kids up, but wanting to raise them in the fear and admonition of God raising them to be warriors in the kingdom, raising our, our daughters to love and respect the men in their lives, and raising our sons to honor the women in their lives as though they were sisters until they become their wives. God, raising our boys and our girls to read your word to dig deep into scripture, to apply it to their lives so that when they're in middle school and high school and college and their friends are, are tempting them to go one direction, not only do they say no, but they drag their friends the other way towards you. God, I pray that our homes will be a home of peace, that like the proverb said, mothers and fathers will rejoice in their kids. And God, we, we ask you that, like Numbers says, that you would bless us, you would keep us, you would be on every side of us, and that you would bring peace to our homes. And God, I pray above all, above everything else, this salvation would be a part of our homes that the gospel would be heard on the lips of parents and from the mouths of babes. That our children would understand that we are sinners in need of a savior and that God our Father in heaven sent his one and only son Jesus into this earth to be that savior, to be the Messiah promised, to be God in the flesh, the one who was fully God and fully man. Jesus, you gave your life you paid the penalty for all of our sins and you rose from the dead. And we trust you and we love you. God, bring salvation to our families. 
God, I just pray that you would bless us. Bless this church. Bless the moms and dads. Bless the other voices in the lives of our, of our children. And God, thank you for blessing us with kids. Thank you for blessing us with children. God, thank you for blessing us with the greatest treasures in our lives with our kids. God, we love you. We thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. I'll see you Wednesday night. Have a great week.